So uh, basically the idea was to get a bunch of people who are progressive string educators at colleges and universities in a room and just sort of get us talking about where we see string education, where we think it is, where we think it should go. What are we doing, the cool kids, what are we doing differently than the rest of the world? And how do we think that best prepares kids to live in the 21st century in a, in a changing world? So um, if you guys could, I mean, there'd be people watching who don't know who all these celebrities are. So if you guys could just one at a time kind of go through and explain uh, who you are, what, what uh, institution you're at and what you're doing, uh, maybe for just a minute or two, then we can start the chat for people. You wanna call out some names, Matt, so we know who's talking? We'll start with you, Martha, you grab the bull by the horns. So I've heard. <laughs> um, hi, folks. I am Martha Mook. I am an electroacoustic violist, composer, improviser, provocateur, um, creative instigator. That's my latest one. And um, my latest incarnation is I am the director of the brand new multi-style strings program at New Jersey City University. And um, we are just, uh, we had a soft start last year because everything was virtual, but we're off to a roaring start this year. And it's very exciting to, um, to see what happens when you just keep saying yes. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, Rudolf. Hi, I'm Rudolf Hacken. I am a professor of viola and electric strings at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And um, so we just started our electric violin and viola program with this fellow here, Chuck Bontrager, and Hello. that fellow there, Matt Bell. Um, and yeah, so uh, it's it's been a it's a pretty been a pretty exciting journey to get this um, to get this thing underway, and I have a lot of um, prospective students contacting me already for for next year. So I think we'll have a pretty big program, and we're going to Germany in August. The uh, University of Illinois Electric Strings Ensemble, yes, for 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 beer gardens, um, to Bayreuth to the Young Artists Festival there. So some exciting stuff happening. Awesome, Dr. Wallace. Hi, I'm Dr. David Wallace, violist, violinist, composer, electric musician. Um, and I am the chair of the string department at Berklee College of Music in Boston since 2014, formerly was teaching at the Juilliard School for 14 years. So. That's a lot of time in higher ed, and I don't want to leave. It's a good place to be. Awesome. Patty. Hi. So um, I'm Patty Kilroy, and I um, coordinate the strings area in the music department at Cal State Los Angeles in East LA. And um, there I run the orchestra and teach strings music education classes and violin. I play violin. That's a thing I do. Um, and I um, and yeah, I've been just kind of carving out space for the strings department there and building the department I want to see. So <laughs> and that, of course, includes, um, you know, just a access and knowledge of um, electric strings and styles outside of the standard classical canon and it's it's been fun just kind of feeling it out and greg that's me greg byers aka cello greg or by yourself or father greg whatever you prefer to call me uh i am an instructor in cello at carlton college in northfield minnesota and I am also a cello and bass instructor at uh, McPhail Center for Music in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, last year, uh, I was the recipient of an Artist in Residence Award from McPhail Center for Music. And in the midst of the pandemic, we put together a video game music orchestra. 
so that was a super fun thing. We had socially distanced kids. Uh, we got an endorsement from Fishman so that they would have uh, their own amplification for free. And then we got them all dressed up. I told them to dress up as their favorite video game character. So that's a little taste of what sort of craziness I get up to. I've never seen anybody shave their beard in the middle of a performance until I until I met Greg. So holds the distinction. But you didn't see it. He left off, shaved off stage, and then reemerged. And we're like, "Who's that guy singing in Japanese?" For my next trick, I'll I'll shave on stage. I'll do. I'll try that. Wow, that's commitment. So the thing is, in the 21st century, so many of us have, so many of us, well, I do, and probably some of you as well, are making a, a considerable chunk of our income from jobs that didn't exist 20 years ago. And so how do we, as educators in the college and university field, how are we preparing our students for life in a world that and I assume they're going to be like us 20 years from their graduation. A lot of them are going to be doing things that uh, jobs that don't exist yet. So how are we making sure that we're preparing kids for the future and not for the past? And you guys just jump in, uh, whoever would do free for all. All right, <laughs> here I go again. Um, I am, I've been in this a little longer than 20 years um, and all along the way um, I, it started actually my awakening started when somebody gave me a, an album of Jean-Luc Ponty and that blew my mind and from then on I was on a journey and there were no programs in school at that time besides classical music. So I studied classical music all the way through, got a master's degree, but somehow in the middle of that, I ended up buying an electric instrument and um, starting to work with electronics. It, was, it was, wasn't even digital stuff at that time. And I taught myself and I asked a lot of people, um, anybody that I knew what that was doing it. And I, you know, you ask five people and you get 25 different answers. So. All along the, the, the way, I kept thinking I would, I would just love to create a program that I could go to. <laughs> and um, ultimately, I am I'm doing that, putting it together. And, um, but of course, things, are, things develop so quickly with technology and, um, and uses and incorporating that and then um, I, I point to what happened, you know, these last 18 months and that we had to, we had to jump light years. We had to, you know, we had to jump 20 years in 18 months, basically, to be able to not just sustain ourselves, but to, to prepare for, for something like that happening again, or not, not even just happening again, just carrying that into the, the future with us. Yeah, uh, one thing uh, I've noticed too is that, that there's sort of two ways you can advise students on career development. And one is do the same thing everybody else does, but better, which is sort of the orchestral excerpt preparation model, right? You, you have the same list and you just play, play the same exact stuff the same way, but better. And the other way is to do something so unique that you're the only person doing. And that second option has basically been missing entirely from collegiate string uh, programs till now. I mean, that that you actually encourage people, you might tolerate uniqueness, but certainly not encourage, like if, if a student is lucky that the, their uniqueness isn't squashed. And I think there can be some balance, like you should be able to do some mainstream things, obviously just to get an orchestra job and all that, but um, so what I try to do with every student who comes in is just ask them what they want to do. And they, they come up with completely, I don't even have to encourage diversity of styles because they, you know, one of them comes in and says he wants to play Carnatic music. The other one comes in and says Japanese pop music. Next one says Scottish fiddling. The next, you know, they all say completely different things. And I just help them do 
what they want to do. And that also ties into another thing, another aspect of mu being a music professor. It's always been assumed that you know every aspect of everything you're teaching. So if you're going to teach a student, you, you know the instrument, the style of music, everything about it. But of course, if somebody comes in and plays Carnatic music, I don't know everything about Carnatic music. So I have to approach it more like an engineering professor who, I mean, my siblings are, you know, plenty of those in my family. And they expect students to have knowledge that they don't have, but that doesn't mean they, they can't teach them. They, they help them um, find what they want to do and they learn from their students. And so that's also a big adjustment. Uh, and it, it, what's interesting is that music is considered, you know, really creative art. But when I look at my brother's classes in electrical engineering, honestly, they seem almost more creative than a lot of music classes. Um, and it, it's partly because of that. Also, the professors in those departments are always learning new technology. I mean, they're expected to keep up. Uh, new technology and not just say, well, you know, that, that's just a bunch of child's play and you need to be serious and pretend it's, you know, 1880. Uh, so I think those things are changing now uh, pretty rapidly. I see that uh, all over. Yeah, b building on on Rudolph's point, just I I actually just really enjoy listening listening to what my students are interested in and like honestly kind of learning learning with them. I do I do a lot of transcriptions, for example, in my applied lesson work and um, in in like a lot of the I, I teach a lot of cla like lecture classes and most of my assignments are really geared towards having even even in the gen eds I teach general education classes I teach they're really they're really geared towards allowing people to discover things for themselves yeah. and just start sifting through all the content that's on the internet these days, like giving them the tools to be able to find their way through everything. Um, I don't know. It actually, I, I feel like when I, when I started teaching in higher ed, I was really nervous about having to know everything. And I, I haven't been teaching in higher ed that long. I mean, probably, I guess, uh, uh, I guess like six or seven years now full-time I've been teaching I've been teaching full-time since 2019 but I taught part-time for a while before that and I, when I first started I was so I felt a lot of pressure to know everything and then I just kind of started listening to my students and I thought that it, it feels really good and I feel like they're actually happier that way and feel more creatively fulfilled that way. I think one of the things that this group is all about is a redefining and broadening what it really means to be a musician. And I think that's really um, something that had to change because in the 20th century, everything became very specialized, you know, so that you didn't just, you know, it's like in back in the day there, were, you would, couldn't get a degree on English horn, for example, you know, you were an oboist and you did that, you know, or there wasn't, there's such a division that, okay, you're the performer, you're not the composer, you don't get to think about things. And so in a sense, everybody in this group has been about redefining what a musician does. We don't necessarily just play one instrument. We do arrange, we do compose, we do know something about production and engineering. We know a lot about collaboration. And so in a sense, we've become much broader. And in some ways, you know, I used to make the argument that in some ways what we're doing is backwards looking, because if you look at someone like Bach, he was fluent in many national styles of music, he was able to improvise and do lots of things right on the spot, fluent in multiple instruments. And so that was very different from the model that we were classically forced into. You know, and I think the other thing that has been challenged, especially over the past couple of years, is the, the dogma of the canon, the Eurocentrism of the canon and the racism of the canon and the needing to break the paradigms open. Um, I mean, there's a real Western bias in a lot of colleges and you know, that's changing 
you know, I've, I've heard some really wonderful concerts with Martha's students last spring where you had, you did have the Carnatic music influence, you did have jazz, you did have Latin and these other things. And so like, I mean, tonight I was just at um, a microtonal theory class that Simone Shaheen, our, our professor who's a world renowned Arabic musician was teaching. And I'm auditing it this uh, semester because I want to develop my ear to hear a system of music that I don't know that over half the world's population knows and grows up in. And I, you know, there is refinement in meaning there that I need to know and be able to communicate. And so I think that's another thing that this group models is an openness and a curiosity that was in many ways discouraged by the old way of doing things. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. I had a student whose genre was Turkish EDM and viola and uh, an EDI. And I didn't know anything about Turkish EDM. I didn't know it existed. I didn't know what made that distinct from, say, Pakistani EDM, which is another thing. But, you know, it gave me a chance to delve in. And even if I don't know that, I do know viola. I know how to play viola. I know technique. I know production. I know composition and arranging. And I, I could point out different things and say, OK, what are you looking for? I mean, that's the other thing I think in coaching composers, what does the piece want to do? Because if it's a good piece, it has a life of its own and a will of its own. And if you listen to it and respond to it, it develops just like a child. And so in a sense, if you get people almost observing their art in a Zen sort of way and able to listen to it rather than just impose their ego on it, I guess that's kind of a John Cage thing, you know, but, but I think that's what we're trying to model here. It's an openness, it's a curiosity, it's a willingness to be many things and embrace many things. And to, to admit, we don't have it all figured out. We're all, we're all apprentices of music and we're helping other fellow apprentices on the way. Well, it's hard to add to that, but I, I agree. It's about giving students the tools to figure out how to grow their art, right? And uh, to kind of loop it back to what Martha said in the beginning, so much of like my journey into jazz and other music was just listening to records I liked and trying to find pianists or guitarists or non-string players to pick their brain and, uh, you know, just trying to figure it out on my own. And so... Um, I had a lot of teachers that were very generous and very helpful and willing to sort of help me figure things out. And I had other teachers that were completely against that and told me that I should stop wasting my time and just stick to what had always been done on the instrument. Uh, and so I know for me, when I teach students, it's, it's much more of like, yeah, if we can bring some of what they're inspired by and passionate about to the table, to our lessons, to whatever, it's already going to create that intrinsic motivation to to uh, be a better musician. And as uh, teachers at a higher education institution, I think the whole thing is that we can find legitimacy in almost any style of music. And like everybody's been talking about, if we go into the technical aspects of it, if we go into how are we operating our instrument, are we playing with authentic articulation or intonation or whatever, depending on the style, all those things can be applicable into any style of music, far beyond classical music. And for for a, a very long time, it has been, no, only this style of music can be studied at this level, and only this music has the attributes to be this, you know, um, me, you know, meticulously, you know, rehearsed over. But I disagree, and uh, beyond that, you know, once again, if you get students really passionate about it, they're going to work hard on it. My example is I got a cello ensemble this semester, and they wanted to really play some music from a Hayao Miyazaki film, um, the Studio Ghibli music. So we're doing a song from Spirited Away. And why? Because they had none of them had a single clue about arranging, but I do. And I said, okay, I'm going to arrange something for all y'all. There we go. Um, and why? Because, uh, sort of referring back to Matt's question... I knew getting out of school, I wanted to be able to do more than perform. And 
now that I have those arranging skills, that allows me to help my students to create a piece for them, and uh, good things ensue, right? So. Yeah, and I don't want people to think that we're just say, hey, we're just going to trash the old model. It's garbage. We're not going to do classical music anymore. There's no more Beethoven. Um, although that, I mean, that, maybe that's on the table. But um, so especially people like Doc, who've, who've taught at some of the, the most conservative conservatories and now is at one of the most progressive institutions, I would love to know what each of you guys think from the old model, which has produced some amazing players. What parts of that do we keep? What parts of that do we change? And what parts of that do we get rid of? Well, I mean, for me, I want to keep the stuff that is genuinely traditional, you know, that, that honestly is historically accurate and not the stuff that has just sort of been developed in the 20th century. Uh, and, and, and one of the things is that, you know, people experimented with instruments all the time. I mean, Bach experimented with keyboard instruments and, and with strings like, like, like crazy, right? And um, the idea of putting a strap, you know, a, a shoulder strap or neck strap on the instrument comes from him. Um, and the, now the idea that you just, everything has to stagnate. You can't add any, you know, you can't add frets, you can't add extra strings, you can't change the shape of the instrument. That's not historically accurate. And so I think if we really honestly go back to how things were in the 18th and 19th century, that's basically what we're doing. You know, I mean, that's, that's how I, I see it, really, that we're, going, we're actually restoring it to what it was. And... I would not say that necessarily the the classical chops need to be kept, although I, I, I think they do. But what I think is, is even more important is the, um, the ability to look at some of the, the very refined, very time-honored process of looking at someone's playing setup and analyzing the way that they play, what they're trying to play, and, and working out an extremely efficient and, especially in the last 20 years or so, tension-free way of getting that sound, that capability. Um, dovetailing a little bit on, the, on the, the, the previous question, there isn't anything that we can't play, right? And especially, there isn't, there isn't a style that doesn't work for bowed strings. And especially when you consider the, the, the easy portability, the easy ability to move around a, a stage if that's, if that's your concert venue. You know, we do that better than just about anybody. And now, especially with the, with the advent of truly useful, serviceable electric instruments and good processing, there, there isn't anything that we can't do. And most of it we can do at least as well as anybody else on the planet. You look and with the exception of percussion, you know, hitting something with something else, which is cool, and the human voice, which we've always had, what instrument is more pervasive throughout the world than bowed strings? You know, it's it we're we're everywhere. Um, so the the ubiquitousness of the of the instrument family, the broader family, and the the uh, the attention to detail of various techniques that has been developed not only in the Western European model, but in classical musics all over the world, um, you you keep you keep your ears working, you keep your chops up, you keep your mind and heart open. There isn't anything that we can't play or can't teach. Yeah, and, and uh, strings being everywhere that includes hip hop, where right? it's pretty interesting how you know you you never would have thought. That they would want violins on stage, but it's it's a pretty pervasive thing. So I run this. Tell, tell them about your band. Oh well, I run this. Uh, I, so a few years ago, I started this class, the Hip Hop Collective, and so originally I just wanted, you know, originally it was hip hop strings, and I just thought, okay, we'll get some arrangements and just play them, you know, like that for fun, and then I thought, well, I'll add some actual hip hop artists, you know, and so from there. 
I changed it to the Hip Hop Collective. Now it has 32 students in it. And I just say anybody who plays anything is welcome. It doesn't matter if you know anything about hip hop or not. And so I've had uh, someone playing uh, musical saw and another person playing comenche, another person playing a bamboo flute. And uh, now I have one guy uh, playing the tabla and, uh, you know, and, and he's in there, he knows his, he's from India and he knows his, his Carnatic music 100%. But then he approached this trumpet player he was playing with. He said, you know, that was beautiful playing. And so, so what is that instrument? He said, well, it's a trumpet. And he said, well, okay, yeah, I'm still learning a you know, trumpet, oboe, a trumpet. You know, I, I'm not quite clear on all these instruments. And it was actually really refreshing for me to see that someone could be that skilled at music. I mean, he was, you know, he figured out the rhythms and, you know, was really doing hip hop tabla. But, you know, didn't, no, wasn't completely overwhelmed by European music. There was, I was actually really pleased to see that. Uh, because, you know, a European wouldn't know the difference between a sitar and a vena necessarily, you know, or they might, but we just expect everybody to know our music. And that was actually... Mm. Um, I just wanted to, to um, mention that one, one of the really... Um, magical things that have that have been hitting me is that as all of a sudden we're there's collaborations cross collaborations with other departments with other genres with other divisions all of a sudden all the jazz ensembles have string players in them yeah. and they they never did before <laughs> um you know there's a salsa band there's there's a um, um a mixed ensemble band so um we did something with dancers and it's it's like everybody's understanding now they they can reach over the the you know the line and collaborate with somebody else on a different instrument on a different style and um i also i started a um, um a technology in performance and composition class also which is open to to all the music majors and i i had trumpet players and percussionists that are, are they're so freaked out because they've never done anything with electronics and i just I give them the you know pedals and i i set up a whole lab and now i can't get them out of it because <laughs> they just they're finding they're finding dimensions to their creativity that they didn't even know existed before and you know i just keep giving ideas and, and saying like i said i said i say yes and i just give little, little ideas like to the trumpet player put a harmon mute on and and put that through the microphone and put that through some effects pedals and he's like oh yeah so let them experiment that's that that's where they're they're finding it and they're coming up with some amazing things Yeah, and I think that's exactly right. This, we we have we have so much focus on developing skills and not not enough focus on simply getting together and just experimenting. And so, just like Martha said, there, you know, one student has some effects box and shows it to another student. Hey, can you play your trombone into that? And you know, some something really cool happens. So. And even something as simple as I mean, we this is our first semester on campus for like a, for like a year and a half. So I I'm, I've just been really focusing this semester on getting my strings together and getting them like in the room and playing and socializing together. But like one thing I, I have like a monthly studio class that I do with them where they can play for each other. But I just started like last month when we did the, the studio class, I was like, let's just do a free jam. Let's see what happens. And I don't think they had done that before like these these kids and just like giving them access like just giving them a chance to like experiment as as Martha said is I think really key and 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 it's interesting I I have mostly a music ed uh, base of students so they're going to be educators like in in the Los Angeles area when they graduate and an orchestra um yeah, I had them warm up for the first couple of weeks with just in C, and I'm probably going to do that every semester. That was really fun, and they got to see that type of notation. When we were remote, I brought in um, 
a guy that rooted everybody on his souped up computer for clean feed and showed them this piece by Angelica Negron called Marejada that's like very textural and like doesn't need to line up precisely and it they seemed like they really enjoyed it and you know they're, they're better for it because now they like I, now they know that those sort of pieces are a thing that are like that exist and are legitimate and worth attention and yeah yeah and Helica is so great like just just an amazing musician <laughs> she also plays fruits and plants oh <laughs> um but yeah, I, I think just like giving them opportunities to experiment and have access. And like, I don't know. I mean, I when it comes to like traditional conservatory curricula, like I I think having a like time in an orchestra is, is important because I mean, like, especially like once you're out of school, if that's not your jam, like you off like, I, I don't know, I haven't played a Brahms symphony in many minutes. Right. So it's it's good to have that a little bit, but I don't think it has to be the whole thing and um I, like just decentering it a little and just like making them aware of what else is out there is is i don't know would be nice <laughs> and i where i hope things go eventually like just across the board with university music programs yeah for me i feel like there is definitely what what i got out of my undergrad was it allowed me to like improve as a musician over for years and I really needed that. I couldn't have just like gone out into the music industry and made it at that point. And I really needed uh, a time to just evolve and figure some things out and just get ready to be a professional. And so that was really important and really helpful for me. And I think that, you know, um, a music school setting can really provide you that, a place to just hone your craft and uh, like we're talking about, you know, I think we need to think about what that craft is, right? Because it has for so long been like, oh, well, you want to, you know, play your concerto with the orchestra. And that's great. And you're right. Like, I haven't played an orchestra for a while in that traditional classical repertoire sense. And so there should be opportunities for people to do that. But um, I, I would say if there was something that, that I would want to change and offer my students, it, it's... Not uh, yes, absolutely. Opportunities to develop creativity, because uh, some people have said that. So absolutely, but also, just being realistic about what the skills are that are going to help you with a career in music. Um, and if it's a music educator, that's one set of skills. But even still, when I talk to high school string orchestra teachers, you know, and they they're buying arrangements of Uptown Funk for their students. So it's, of course, it's only going to help them if they know a little improvisation, they know a little arranging, they know a little bit about playing in modern styles, right? Or performers, if I'm not getting paid to play in an orchestra, well, then what am I getting paid to do? And uh, my favorite example is when I was doing my very, very first recording session at University of Miami, and I thought I was hot stuff, and I thought I, I was going to knock it out of the park, and here's this really easy part for the singer-songwriter. And I had to do it an embarrassingly uh, copious amount of times. I had to just take after take. Oh, this is a little that tune. Oh, this was a little that. And it was embarrassing, frankly, but I had just never had that experience of recording in a studio under that pressure um, in that setting. And eventually I learned if I just take a ear off and I can listen to my natural tone, infinitely changed my ability to play in a recording session. And so, like, no one ever told me that. My cello teacher never told me that. So um, keeping that environment to be able to foster, you know, a place and hone your skills, but questioning what the best skills are to give your students a career would be what I would change. And maybe giving them the choice to decide which, which skills are going to be useful to them like based on where they envision themselves being right like yes yes i mean I, I love what what greg kind of said about basically schools teaching you how to be a lifelong learner i mean if if you're only there for three four years six years maybe tops that's really not enough time to get everything you need and i think with what like patty was saying is what do they want and need for what they do i mean the trouble with curriculum is it grows 
it evolves in strange ways and stuff gets added and it never gets taken away. And if people are asked, what do the students need? Everybody has a long list of what they think the students need, whether or not they do. Guess what? I really have not needed tenths. Sorry. <laughs> you know, uh, that's a lot of pages from the Carl Flesch scale book that, uh, you know, I could have just burned. Um, you know, but at the same time, and by the way, if you do Mozart Sinfonia Concertant, the way you're supposed to tuning the viola up a half step, the tenth is an open string. Yeah. That's the one case violists need a tenth. And if you do it the way Mozart wrote it, uh, then you don't have to stretch. But, you know, I mean, I think Chuck had a point where ergonomics are super important. I mean, I get one of the things that I see at Berkeley, because we're getting students who are outside of the box, you get a lot of people who are self-taught or maybe did not have the benefit of a private lesson, or, you know, they're in a great school orchestra program, but the teacher doesn't have the ability to give everybody the individual attention to say, hey, if you're playing like this all the time, you're going to hurt yourself, you know? And so there's lots of bad habits that need correcting. Um, you know, and so I think the ergonomics and the efficiency that has come through years and decades of refining and finding better ways, you know, at the same time, you might see a player from another tradition other than Western classical, who's even more ergonomic, or there's other things that work. The other thing is there can be ways that classical technique can work against you. I mean, I'm a big fan of Martelet and Kreutzer and all that and developing this really great sense of articulation. But if you want to groove, you actually need a more laid back attack. The, the ability to ghost is super important and the ability to, to not have a constant vibrato, you know, and, and finding different shades. So, I mean, there's, there's elements that I see the really highly trained classical players sometimes have to fight against, you know, and this even gets into areas like um, the core of music theory and literature and things. It's like, I know there's, there's a lot of people in order to make room are wanting to throw away counterpoint or throw away chorale writing and things. But at the same time, this morning, I taught a lesson, uh, a student who was writing his own viola concerto. And I looked at the voicing and it was just beautiful. It was just gorgeous. You know, he had gone to a conservatory in Turkey. This is a different student than the EDM one, you know, but, you know, he was just, I, I said, I don't have to tell you anything because this is going, it's voiced well, the leading goes great. You know, I just gave him a couple little timbre things. And because he'd gone through that classical harmony and voice leading, on the other hand, this is someone who's wanting to compose a concerto. Not every student wants or needs to compose a concerto and they might be better off learning how do the harmonies work on a lead sheet and being able to find the thirds and the sevenths and connect them and follow a chart may be much more important to them than can they do species counterpoint. Um, you know, so in a sense, it's back to what Patty says, what do the students want to do and how do they get there? What Rudolph was saying, I asked the student what they want to do. And so we need a curriculum that is customizable and we need faculty who are knowledgeable enough and a team that's diverse enough that we can help the student get what all of us can contribute. I mean, that's the benefit when there's a school that has more than one person who's doing this is you can get the benefit of the whole team. So there are people who are way better at jazz than I am or various forms of like Arabic music, Near Eastern music, Chinese music. Um, and, and so there can be a whole range of things. I, I, you know, I, I'll cite one example of a student who's, who's really gotten a lot out of his Berkeley experience. There's a, a fiddler, Avery Merritt, who's doing great in Nashville. He just made his um, Grand Old Opry debut. He came to us. He was a pretty smoking fiddler already, you know, uh, and a very much a bow through the sound post kind of sound. Um, pretty sophisticated language. So he kind of made the rounds. He, he studied intently with Matt Glazer, um, was going head to head with some other students. That's the other thing about going to college and being part of a community is learning, egging each other on, getting better, learning from each other. Uh, so he was very much in the roots community, but also along the way, he spent a lot of time with me and Sandra Cott because he's like, okay, I know there's my sound is limited. 
and I'm not comfortable and I've got some pain. And so, you know, it's when I saw that Grand Old Opry debut, I'm like, holy cow, I'm seeing me and Sandy and his bow arm because we we put him through some boot camp and he wanted it. We didn't force it on him. And had we had he not wanted it and had we tried to give it to him, it probably wouldn't have taken, but he knew he wanted stuff. Um, you know, another thing, first day when he did his ratings audition, it's like, do you have any interest in playing horses? No, <laughs> never. Uh, so long about his fifth semester, he got a letter and he came and knocked on my door. He's like, I've been assigned to the orchestra. Uh, can I, he was trying to get out. It's like, no, you can't get out of this. It's the Lord of the Rings symphony in Symphony Hall, which is one of the great halls. You'll be playing Howard Shore's film scores for Howard Shore. He'll be there. You'll, we need you in the second violin section. You'll, you need to learn how to play in a section anyway. If you're gonna move to Nashville, you're gonna need to be able to, to play. And you know, sure enough at the concert, he was sitting there in the first stand, a second violins or second stand and was just beaming ear to ear. It was a good experience. And then later in the semester when Aoife O'Donovan came to record some music videos, he was, he was a shoe in for the quintet because he could blend and do the orchestral skills. So that's someone who did a lot of stuff that he wasn't thinking this is my bag or it's not something that I might be using, but it's all, fed into a, a deeper musicianship. One other thing I'll say, which may not be super essential, but I'm finding it's really critical for students who are looking to have a freelance career is reading. You know, and so a lot of the students we're getting in these programs, great ears, great coordination, improvisational ability, but they might be in a situation where they can't read something that's Suzuki book three or four level. And if you want to go and hang in New York or in any kind of city and you're planning to go head to head with classical conservatory graduates, you got to work on that reading or you're not going to get called back for the gigs. So, I mean, that's that's a challenge, too, is how do you get those reading skills developed? You know, as Patty mentioned, orchestra is one of the best places to get that. But, um, you know, I think, again, some students may not need that but it's what do the students need and how do you provide it for them and how do you give them a menu so that they can choose in the limited time that they have. Yeah, I love that all this talk is centered around preparing students to compete in, in the workplace. You know, obviously music is an art and we wanna advance art for art's sake. Of course, that's, that's one of the, the beauties of being at a institution of higher learning is that we do want to advance art for art's sake. But at the end of the day, when our students graduate, they have to get jobs. So we have to make sure that they're prepared for employment. And there are so many different types of employment and strings that I see a lot of the classical conservatories are trying to pair you to be a soloist. And if you fail at that, you can play in the orchestra. And then that's it, right? You know, if you if you can't get one of those two gigs, then I don't know. Maybe uh, you can try to pick up some private students and try to teach them how to do the things that you're not good enough to do, which is why you're now teaching because you didn't. Not that you don't teach because you're not good enough to do those things, but you're trying to be a soloist, and your your third fallback is being a teacher. Then, I mean, you weren't good enough to be a soloist, so how are you going to teach somebody else to be a soloist? No. Well, I think that the thing is all about having the options and and the legitimacy of having the the option to to play different styles, multi styles, progressive, eclectic, whatever you you know you you happen to choose to call it. Um, and that was, you know, when when I in Jersey City is across right across the river. You can see Manhattan from here, um, and there's no sense in on trying to form another classical. Um, string program because we're surrounded by terrific string programs like that so but but we have the option of calling on the bringing in master master clinicians and uh teachers um my the students are going in to concerts at Lincoln Center and at Juilliard and, and they're going to the far corners of Astoria Queens you know to go um, to go listen to the to music and and they're listening to everything and they're bringing it back and they're trying new things, um, and you know that's the location we're we're right here in the in New York City so that's part of the 
the outlook of what we've got going on here. Um, um, just to say that if we wanted to play, and we have played a Bach Brandenburg concerto and gone and gone into we we did a program with Bach. We did a program with Rhiannon Giddens at the Purchasers Option. Um, I had a bunch of fiddlers, different, very different style fiddlers that all did their own version of a Shokin Farewell, and then the, and then this whole string ensemble played it, and it was really cool. Um, and just finding, uh, putting together um, repertoire could be classical repertoire and giving it a twist, you know. Um, that's why you know I, I've burned down Brandenburg so many times, <laughs> um, but that just just knowing that there's the option to do that and it's legitimate. That is, I think, that is the thing. I I I have a lot of the students that say, well, there you know, there's their teachers told them no, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't whatever improvise or or play other styles, um, and I think we're saying yeah, it's okay and encouraging them and supporting them and. That's what we're about, I think. All right. Well, as, as parents are thinking about sending their kids to school, um, you know, they want to make sure that their their kids are going to a place where they're going to learn the things they need to know, and they're going to be around people who care about them and want them to to learn employable skills. So, I, so maybe if each of you could sort of give like a a two minute pitch on why a student would want to come to your school and what they would learn there. Um, and so, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll just sort of do the same uh, order. Maybe uh, Martha, we'll start with you. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I've sort of given part of the, the, the pitch, but really, I mean, I'm, I'm a New Yorker, born in New York, and I've been able to make a career out of playing classical music, playing Broadway shows, playing opera, ballet, going in and do, uh, you know, rock and roll or hip hop. Um, and that's part of the location. So it's the location, it's the resources that are there. Um, it's the, if I, you know, I have students coming in and I see, well, this one is, a, is more of a, you know, a jazz player. I, I called Regina Carter and she's teaching. We have a fiddler player you know, a couple of fiddlers I called Jeremy Kittle. And there and the thing is, call, you know, call all these professionals and they're happy to be part of the growth of the evolutionary process of strings. Um, and if I had a, you know, um, a klezmer player, I'd call a, you know, Alicia Spiegels or somebody and, and get somebody that's, I'm not gonna dare to teach a style that I, I don't know, I can encourage and I can coach. But for that technique, I'll call in the pros for that. And we have, you know, again, in, in the location here, that's what we have access to. Um, and going out to hear performances. I have some, you know, a student that came from Arizona and she's just in the city all the time. They went to see Zach Brock play the other day and were bl totally blown away. And um, by the same token, they, you know, they went to an orchestra concert the week before. So, um, to have all that input and then amongst themselves to see what collaborations they're coming up with. Um, and so that's what I think I'm, I'm more, I'm sitting back more than I thought I would and just kind of saying, yes, do it and, and watching them and, and watching this whole uh, garden blossom on its own, you know, better than having me, you know, rein it in and say, no, don't do that or do it the way I do it. Heck no, I'm learning from them. I love that. Uh, Rudolph. Well, uh, so I teach at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And, you know, not only is it a great school of music, it's also one of the uh, world's great research institutions. So like uh, Microsoft hires more new employees from this university than any other. Um, and so every aspect of the technology of electric strings that you possibly want to know about or explore can be learned here. And so, so we have several 3D printing labs where I've already had students uh, print their instruments. And you can take courses where you really learn the ins and outs of, you know, uh, creating, uh, you know, manufacturing speakers and transducers and all that. 
So from the technological aspect, uh, you can learn anything you want uh, right here in depth. And then musically, uh, just because it's a, such a big school of music, we have all kinds of ensembles. So we have, and obviously, this hip-hop collective. I do, but uh, several big jazz bands and the black chorus, and you, know, you play like gospel music with them, and um, you know the gamelan ensemble and the Balkan ensemble, so forth. So you can basically study any any style of music and any technological aspect of instrument building, um, and. And just the sheer number of students, with 52,000 students, uh, that's one thing I've noticed in the Hip Hop Collective, there's always somebody who knows what you're looking for. And so you can just learn it from a fellow student. Um, and you know, 4,000 of our students are from China, and probably another 3,000 from Korea, and another 3,000 from India. So uh, the, the cultural diversity is also enormous. So, uh, in some sense, you know, we're in the middle of, of the soybean fields, but in another sense, we're really uh, sort of, we run the gamut of every culture in the world here. So that's my pitch. And of course, I teach here, which is the most important, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no small selling point. Um, Doc. Well, I, I think one of the things about Berkeley, it was founded in 1945 under the premise that music can be taught by the music of the day, which back in the day was jazz, which then expanded to rock and then world music and electronics. And also with that, it was founded by working musicians for working musicians. And I think one of the things that's extraordinary is there's 12 different majors. So not all of them are, not everybody here is, is either performers or educators, which was the model at, you know, University of Houston where I did my undergraduate. But, you know, those are definitely options. We've got them, but there's film scoring, electronic production and design, music business. And many of those go on to work for Spotify and Apple and a lot of the, the big companies, contemporary writing and production, music therapy. Uh, there's so many different opportunities. And the thing is with 5,000 students studying all these different majors, when Berkeley's working the way it should, it really is a microcosm of the music industry. So you might be a performance major who starts a band and you decide, okay, we're going to get these music production and engineering students to produce our first EP and some music videos. We're going to get a music business major who's going to manage our East Coast tour over spring break. And so you have all this, it's basically like a whole bunch of startup companies uh, beginning a life. And just like in the real world, some bands flourish and go on to great things and win some Grammys and others flop and hate each other within months. I mean, it's amazing to see the kinds of drama where it's like, this is the real world. This is, you know, it's, it's, and, you know, I remember being at Juilliard and faculty and saying, well, wouldn't it be great if we got together with Fordham University and got their business majors collaborating with us? And there's all these ideas of how can we reach out and make this stuff happen? But it was our, at Berkeley, it's all here. It happens naturally and organically. Um, so I think those are some really extraordinary things. Another wonderful thing about the string department and the American Roots program, we've got about 20 string faculty who are really diverse and do different things. And you have the opportunity to work with all of us kind of in more of a village environment. So it's not like, okay, if, if you're my student, you only study with me for the next four years of your life. And if you change teachers, I will never speak to you again. And then I'll see that you don't get in a good ensemble, which sadly is something you hear a lot at some of the more classical conservatories. And some of us experience that sort of thing, but it's more like, no, I don't know everything. Um, and as a matter of fact, if you really want to learn how to play bebop, you go over there and you work with Rob Thomas or Sarah Caswell, you need to get some chops over there. So that really the students are able to hopefully by the time they're done, be able to do more than any one of us faculty can do by the virtue of working with us as a team. 
the other thing I'll say is, is similar to what Rudolph says, we're, we're not trying to create cookie cutter musicians who do one thing. You know, we we are working with everybody as an individual, helping them to expand and develop their individual musicianship and voice. And I think that really holds true to everybody on this, this panel, but, you know, we're looking to nurture the individual talent, the individual voice and launch the individual career. So it's a really good opportunity to, to do that. The other thing that I think is just beautiful, we've, we're also a very international school, about 40%, I think, of the students are international students. And so we've got, I remember one summer realizing we had students from every continent, but Antarctica on the stage, all string players. And when you have those kinds of collaborations and those traditions coming together, new music results that couldn't happen if it weren't for those specific people. And that's, that's what keeps me getting out of bed and biking to school every morning. Awesome. Patty. Uh, yeah. So um, I teach at Cal state LA in the department of music. Uh, we're in a great part of LA. I love East LA. Like it's a really fun area great food um and yeah i, I guess I, I just feel really lucky i'm this program is like the faculty really act collaboratively and they really care about the individual student in their growth um we have a really diverse student body at our school our school i think is 78 percent latinx and um and we have a really wide range of personal situations and we really just want to provide access to everyone to be able to get a music education and learn and get better if they want to. Um, and, you know, for me personally, it's just really important that string players have an opportunity to explore, you know, if, if you're a music ed major or a performance major, or even if you're just a non -ma like not a music major and you're rolling in the play orchestra, I, I really want to give everybody that's like a string player a range of experiences so they know like oh there are these many different ways of making music and it's all legit and i can have fun in all these contexts um and yeah i i, I really am interested in serving students because there, there are a lot of really amazing cal states who already are more of the kind of uh straight ahead classical route so i i i and building this program to really serve the students who who are interested in a career that's more blended, who might want to have skills that are a little outside the traditional box that maybe want to do pursue a blend of performance and education and composition and do all the things, you know. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I've I've played in a lot of different situations when I was I used to freelance in New York before I moved here with and I would play classical stuff but also with like rock bands brazilian groups i played i went through like a balkan folk music fades i like to make stuff up in ableton with loopers and effects that i find on the internet so and i played a lot of contemporary music so i don't know i i always really enjoy meeting individual students and figuring out how my interests align with theirs and what part of what i've learned will serve them and help them grow and figure their figure it out and I don't know, our school has a bunch of really cool ensembles uh, and we, we always encourage the students to play in as many as possible. Um, they're really open-minded to that, which I also feel very lucky about. Like you can play in the school mariachi. Um, you could, there, we have an Afro-Latin ensemble that's like a charanga band. Uh, we have a new music ensemble, a jazz band that string players totally played in <laughs> before I like pushed them to do it, before I was even there really. Um, we have a commercial music ensemble, two actually, two bands, like big bands. They're doing they're doing a concert next Thursday. They're doing like a Motown concert, I think. And you, you know they can take composition classes. I don't know. I I like pushing string players toward those opportunities so they can help them find their way. And that's what they would do if they came to this school. <laughs> that was really long. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, great. Not at all. Yeah, I love that. And Greg. Okay, well, I'm gonna do two uh, because, well, I'll, I'll tell about the second one in a second. So, uh, 
if you're like me and you lived in LA and you absolutely hated it, no offense, Patty, uh, so you should come to the exact opposite place in the world, but that still has a great quality of life and a good music scene, oh, about 45 minutes away with no traffic. Uh, of course, I'm talking about Northfield, Minnesota. Um, and <laughs> Carleton College is great. Uh, I would describe it uh, Oberlin-esque, Oberlin-esque. So a lot of poly uh, polyglots, a lot of people that aren't necessarily uh, music majors, uh, but they're very passionate about having a wide range of skill sets and studying a lot of things while they're in college. Um, it's, it's a very diverse campus. Uh, I have a student right now from Ghana, another from Pakistan, um, all sorts of students, especially for the, the school size. I don't think there's more than several thousand students there. So um, it's a great campus, beautiful space. The faculty is phenomenal. Uh, and I'm, uh, yeah, there's some really, really interesting folks that I'm just getting the chance to meet as I've been working there. Um, there's an incredible pipa player, player Gao Hong. Um, so there's a, a wonderful Chinese music program there if you wanna study that. The head of the music department, Andy Flory apparently is the nation's ex expert on Motown music, and he just released a book about the music of Motown. Uh, and I, I love James Jamerson, so we've geeked out about that. Um, but just a really diverse faculty, um, and despite the size of the school, a lot of great opportunities exist, a lot of world-class faculty, um, many good things. But I have to say something else for all of our uh, our friend and colleague, Nicole Yarling, because I have to talk about my alma mater being University of Miami. Gotta just throw a little love out there to Nicole. Um, and she was mentioning this new program, and I just I just looked it up. I don't know a whole lot about this, but when I was there, uh, my senior year, Dean Shelley Berg took over the music school, and his vision for what musicians should be able to accomplish coming out of school, I think is much more aligned with what we've been talking about today. And one of my uh, regrets is not being able to go through a full four years under his uh, tutelage and administration. But uh, they're doing some really incredible things over there. Um, and so there is a, a bachelor's in music and modern art, modern artist development and entrepreneurship which allows the freedom and flexibility for students to focus on their preferred areas of emphasis with outcomes that lead towards a viable career of their own choosing. And I'm just reading that off the website, and if that is not what we have been talking about here, right? I don't know what is. So go Canes, uh, and also incredibly diverse um, city uh, if, if you don't want to be in Northfield, Minnesota, and you want to be in Miami. I do understand, so. Pretty much the same place though, isn't it really? They're so similar. Oh my gosh. And we had actually invited Nicole and she had a scheduling conflict and couldn't be here. And then the other person that we'd invited to was, um, was um, Tracy Silverman, who's at Belmont, which is another fantastic school in Nashville. And it's right there in Nashville in the center of like so much of the American music universe. And you would get to learn from people like Tracy. And they have a partnership with Curb Records. So, I mean, if for people wanting to get into the Nashville record industry, Billy Contreras is also on faculty there, great fiddler and jazz musician. So lots of love for, for Belmont as well. The Miles Davis of the violin, Billy Contreras. He's an alien, dude. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for doing this. This is uh, this has been a lot of fun, and it's it's wonderful to see y'all's faces. And hopefully, we'll be able to hang out in person here before long. Yeah. Well, well, thanks for doing this, Matt, and and congratulations to everybody. I think we're all we're all pushing string playing in in the right direction. It's evolving, um, and and it's bringing everything along and going someplace new as well and i think that's that's just the healthiest way to do it so bravo and i think we're you know music is headed in this direction like we should be at the forefront of you know being able to educate these students because they're going to figure it out on their own one way or another and we have a lot of things that we can offer so yeah one same same thought it's so great to have all these minds together and see how much uh bowstring modern music education is growing Awesome. Well, thanks. 
Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you.